Let's all stand together and sing a good old Southern Gospel song. I think you all probably know it. And uh, there it is right there. All right. Put it in. system a little better it should be a, bit, a little bit more stable platform where it won't be cutting and coming in and out so much we just pray we pray that that, that will be how it is and uh, and I hope that it is a 
a, a good experience and please put your comments in there um, in, in your comment line and, and, and let us know how this is doing to today and, and go ahead and let us know you're out there. Now, a couple of announcements. Uh, we have a business meeting next week. And the business meeting is going to be right at the end of the morning service. I'd ask all of you to be here. It's, we're going to be going over some of the scheduling for this coming next month, especially up through the, the time of the fall. And uh, we have a couple other things to, to present before the church. And it, it shouldn't be a real long business meeting, but we also will be having a deacons meeting uh, before the morning service. That will be at 9.15. And that will be meeting over here in the fellowship hall and we'll meet together and then we'll have our service and also then our business meeting so please stay for that if you're a church member we, we want you to participate in this and this gives you an opportunity to hear about what is going on also too next week we are going to honor our senior high graduates and that will be right here at the, for the morning service and the message will be focusing on on their lives and, and all that they're doing we have we have four graduates in our church and uh, one I know is going to be involved in the military and then there are some others that are going away to college and it's uh, we just want the best for them and we're going to be focusing on them this coming week uh, also too just to let you know uh, a couple of things that are coming down the pike uh, we have uh, we're going to be doing some youth activities throughout the summer and some children's activities. We'll be discussing about that more next week. But also, too, we, we had a joyous happening last evening. Uh, Crystal Lowry is no, no longer Crystal Lowry. Crystal Lowry is now Crystal McMillan. And, uh, and I had the privilege on, on being part of that wedding, and it was a wonder, wonderful wedding. And... Uh, how many of you are familiar with Royal Cafe right here in town? Well, the owner of that, her name is Melissa. Well, Melissa has opened up a wonderful banquet hall up in uh, Flomaton area. Very, very beautiful. That's where this was. And uh, just off of, uh, what is it, 31 that's up there? Is that, is that the main road that kind of goes parallel with 65? And, uh, and it's just up the road from, from where uh, 29 catches it. And it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful setting, and, and it was a it was a wonderful wedding, and I was very, very happy to be part of that. But also, too, I, I do need to share with our church, one of our dear friends from our area has gone to be with the Lord, and is and Donald Bothwell went to be with the Lord. Was it this past? Was it this morning? Did, did this morning he'd been struggling with cancer, and um, and we said that we would lift their family up in prayer. Also, too, before we have a prayer for Donald's family, um, I also want to encourage us to, to keep Pat Meadows in prayer. She took a fall this week. She had to go to the emergency room, but she is home. She uh, She's a little bruised up, but there was no broke, broken bones, so that's a good thing. And um, also, too, uh, let's keep Kay, uh, Kay Neville's in prayer. Uh, she's under the weather a little bit. She, uh, and, um, and also, too, um, let us remember Bill Bryan. Bill Bryan is at home. In fact, I saw his, his note on the, on the comments that he and Johnny are watching. He had a, a knee replacement. So, so just keep him in prayer for his uh, him getting back, in, back into, in, into the swing of things. But at this time, let us go to, to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. And Lord, we have a number of individuals connected with our church and Maybe some that I did not even mention who are going through physical struggles and ailments. And I just lift each and every one of them up, especially those that are in recovery mode from various um, medical procedures and that. But also, too, we lift up the, the Bobo family. And we, we know that, uh, that Donald has, has accepted Christ as Savior. And according to the Apostle Paul and his writings, in the inspired word of God that, that absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. And Lord, I just lift up, and I, I lift up this family, and I just ask that you just wrap your arms around them, allow them to feel your presence. And, and those that are recovering and those that have, that have had some mishaps, Lord, I, I lift them up too, and I ask that you just wrap your arms around them 
and allow them to, to feel your presence also. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Now before we continue on with our music, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a children's sermon time. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite characters in the Word of God. His name is David. Now how many of you have ever heard of David in the Bible? Okay. And we know that he was king of Israel, probably one of the greatest of the kings. But, he, but I'm going to focus on when he was a little boy. Uh, and, and as a little boy, uh, we, uh, he, was, uh, he, he, headed, he was known for a special event where we know that Israel, the army of Israel, was fighting the Philistine army. And the Philistines had collected a gentleman named Goliath. And Goliath, interestingly, was, was probably not Philistine, but he was a giant. He was very, very tall. And he would go out and he would challenge the Israeli army. And he, there wasn't a single soldier in Israel that would stand up to him. Not even King Saul, who was king at that time. Now, King Saul was also a very tall man. Not as big as Goliath, but he was a pretty good-sized guy. He probably a lot of muscles, and strong-looking. And in, in, in people's eyes, he probably was one who could do it. But even he didn't go out against Goliath. And see, you have to understand something. In that day, when an army challenged another army, it wasn't just soldier against soldier, but whoever would win, not only did the army who lost, lost, and not the country only lost, but also their gods lost compared to the gods of the winning army. So there was a lot of stake in this. But here's this boy, he shows up at camp, and what happens? We know that King David takes up the challenge. And what does he do? Does he take Saul's armor, which was probably real big for him and probably heavy, and probably a big old sword of Saul's, very heavy, not just a plastic sword, we're talking about a real sword, and picked up that sword and couldn't hold it. So what does he do? He goes like he was, and he takes, goes down to a little brook, in this area, and I've been to the, to where this took place. And in this little brook, he takes five stones, five smooth stones, put them in, he puts them in a little sack, and he has a slingshot. Now his slingshot back then wasn't one that looked like a Y with the rubber, and it, it didn't look like that. His slingshot was a piece of leather, and in the middle was a pouch. And you would put your rock in the pouch, and you would sling that slingshot like this, and you would have to let one side of that pouch go, and it would shoot the rock out. Now, I, I did this as a, as a young boy. I remember when I was Allison, probably about your age, we would do these Bible stories. I'd hear them in church, and what did we do? We'd go out and try to make the things. We, we, did, we had string though, and we had a little pouch. You know what, those types, of, that type of slingshot didn't work very well. I shot the other slingshots, and they work a whole lot better and more accurate. But what does is, what is David do? He goes out and Goliath comes up with this big, big armor, army unit outfit. He has his armor on and he has his big, his big helmet on and his shield and he has this huge sword. And he's standing there and he's making fun of David. But what does David do? He does what he feels the Lord wants him to do. He does it right. And he takes one stone, just one stone, puts it in that sling, and he starts winding it around. And I'm sure he's trying to aim. Now, he was pretty good at this. He knew what he was doing. And he lets that stone fly. And some, some people who study the Bible say this, that there might have been an open spot right by his forehead, Goliath's forehead. And that stone flew in the air hit him right there, and it knocked him down, and David won. Now why, do, why is this such a great story? Because it shows us that it doesn't matter how big you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how many things you have, all that is great, but if God is on your side and you're doing what you should do for God, that you can, get, you can accomplish anything. And what does that mean for us here? It means even during maybe a harder time in life, because it is different, it is different. I, I know 
I know things had to change a lot because of this virus. I know that. I know some of us wonder a bit. Some of us worry a bit. Some of us wonder a bit. Man. But don't worry. Because if you're serving God and you're doing what's right, and no matter what age we are, we obey our parents, right? That's important. We read our Bible. We pray. We do all these things. If we're doing it right before God, God is with us. And that's important. And you know, not everybody has God with them. But if you know Jesus as your Savior, you do. And that's so, so important. So never worry. And we just can't continue on. And you keep smiling. I like your smile, Allison. Okay? Very good. Well, one other thing. Uh, do we have any visitors today? I think we have one visitor. Uh, Doc, if you could get her a visitor's form, if you would be willing to fill that out, just put it in the offering place so we know of your visit today. And we're so happy you're here. We're so happy you're here. Well, with that said, let us continue on. Brother Doug. sing a great song, number 447, if you have a hymnal, and again, I want to let you know that the hymnals are available, and uh, they've all been sanitized for your protection, so feel free to grab them when you come in, but this is trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.
passage in James. It's a passage of hope, but it's also a passage of warning. And in this day and age that we live in, we need both. Because how we behave in society does make a difference. So James chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. But before we start with the, with the message this morning, I want to just take another another moment in our service to lift up in prayer our leaders in our government. We're in a tough situation in some areas, and some of our leaders in our government need our prayers. Because I can tell you this right now, as long as I've been alive on this earth, I have never seen this much chaos so widespread in cities. Here in Jay, we are very blessed. We, we don't see this, but there are some areas around the country that are seeing extreme, are extreme actions, and it's not good actions. Not to say everything is coming to an end. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but are we seeing the signs of what will come that God promised in the Bible? I think so. Should we worry? I don't think so. I think we can be concerned. I think we can... Look to God to open up doors for us to be the greatest in ministry. And I think all of us, if we know Christ as Savior, we have an opportunity. So at this time, let us call for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, before we begin this message today, on hope and on doing it the right way. And Lord, at this time, I just want to lift up our president of the United States and other world leaders, as many countries are having to make various decisions, not just because of the pandemic, but also too of other, other items. And here in our country, the, the great divisiveness and how certain happenings have sparked protest, but not just protest, looting and other, and other dangerous things in some of our major cities. And Lord, I just ask for your wisdom for our leaders, both in the national level and in the government and in the state level and in the local level, so that we can see what is right and do what is right. And may we as Christians have open doors to walk through, to minister in our communities, and to and to do things maybe outside of the of the normal box we live in. To be able to not just make a change and, and, and bring sanity to, to, some, to some settings and situations and areas, but to reach out for the eternal, the sharing of Christ, which is the most important. What a wonderful song to, bring, to remind us that this isn't really our forever home. Our forever home is in the glories of heaven. We're just passing through here. Yes, we have to live, and yes, we have lives, and we have careers, and we're studying to, some of us here are studying to, to have careers later on in the future, but also to, that we are citizens of the glories of heaven, and may we always be reminded of that. Whatever age we are, whatever station we have in society, and may we always strive to do what's right in your eyes before this world, and we ask this in Christ's name, amen. As, the, as James wrote in his, in his epistle in chapter 4, basically the, the setting is this, and my title of my message is, Draw Near to God, and He Will Draw Near to You. And that is found especially in verse 8 of this passage. But the setting is this, James, the whole book of James basically is about faith without works is dead faith. He's, he never says you have to work your way to heaven. That's not what he says. He, he agrees with the statement, 
You, Christ has done the work for you to become a Christian. But once you're a Christian, we have a great opportunity and a, and a great amount of work ahead of us many times. Doesn't mean we all become missionaries. Now, I, if I look around our congregation, how many of you, uh, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you feel that the Lord's called you to be, to be a missionary in some faraway country? Or what's a big place is Alaska. Anyone ever get called here to Alaska to be a missionary? Probably not. There are a lot of missionaries in Alaska. There, there really are. There are many Bible college students that when they graduate or when they're about to graduate, they get a call to serve the Lord. And where do we go? Alaska. That's where we go. And there are churches in Alaska that are filled with missionaries. And they're not all preaching, but they all want to be preaching. Um, not everybody's called to be a missionary outside of your home. Some are called to just remain here and to do various jobs. But you can still do mission work in your, at your workplace. You can share your faith. You can, it, you, you can make a difference for the Lord. But not everybody's called to be a pastor either. Now, I, I know I've, I've been in settings where you've, I've had a lot of pastors in a, in a church that I've worked with. And uh, it's very interesting. You know, sometimes you'll get their insights. Whether you want to hear it or not, you'll get their insights. And that happens. But not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody's called to be a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody's called to be a minister of music. And we have a great one here serving. Not everybody's called to be a, a youth minister. But we all, once we accept Christ the Savior, are called to be the salt and light in this world. And that's so important. And we need to remember this. And for those of you who are watching on the internet, this goes for all of us, wherever you're at. If you're in this community or you're in other communities around the country or even around the world if you're watching this, that God has a ministry and a mission for all of us. You may not be a uh, quote missionary or pastor or some other uh, called leader like that, but you can minister in the ways that God has opened up for you to do. And that's so important. So let us look and see what James now says and first, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 18, the very last verse. James ends this chapter with, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, that's very different from the, from the position of many in our world today. Many in our world today think, well, if, I, if I'm outspoken, I'll get what I want and I can make, and I can make peace. Well, that doesn't always work. In fact, it's very different from this statement on what's going on around our world. That we need to speak out and yell out. And if that doesn't work, we'll do something else. And we'll, we might even do a criminal act to get noticed. I remember dealing with Alexis, our eldest daughter, who was autistic. That one of the state de department people told us, the squeaky wheel gets, gets the, the job done and gets the attention. And I was told you need to go and confront a lot of people. And you had to get a lot of names and basically say, I'll remember this and write a lot of things down. Well, that might work in certain circumstances, but overall, if you're desiring peace, and I desire peace, I know most people want peace. It's great to wake up in the morning and you have a peaceful house and things around you maybe at work are peaceful. I mean, if peace is great. Things, it's great for things to go well. Sometimes I wonder when things are going so well. I know we got our choir up there in the, in the loft up there a little bit. Uh, but, um, but it's great to wake up. Sometimes I wonder, though, when things go too well, what's going on in my life? Am I going to be in trouble soon? You know, I, I think that way sometimes. But in order to have peace, we have to be righteous, not unrighteous. If you want the true peace of God, unrighteousness isn't going to cut it. Looting is not going to cut it. Breaking and damaging things is not going to cut it. That's not going to bring peace. That's just going to bring more division. And that's been proven not just in our time, but throughout the ages. War has never brought peace. The great war in the Middle East against, the, against those that were called the, the, the great heathens, uh, that the church in, in Europe came down and they had all of those crusades. The crusades didn't work. They failed miserably. 
If you want true godly peace, be righteous. And that's what we need to, to, to demonstrate as Christians. Let us start now. Verse 1, chapter 4. From where comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not here? Even your lust that war in your members. What James says here is he's asking a, a question that doesn't really need an answer. We understand this answer. He says, where do wars and, and fightings come? And he's not just talking about outside the church. He's actually talking about in the church. You know, I remember, well, as a, as a little boy, I heard after the fact that uh, one of the churches my father served in, when he first got there, it was said in that area, the local area, that if you want to go see a good church fight, go to a business meeting at this church. That's a great place to see a good church fight. And you might even see fisticuffs going on. You never know. That happens. We get intense sometimes when we have certain positions we take. Is it the best way to handle things? Probably not. But James here is addressing, what's going on with you all? Well, this word here, lust, it's also pride. It's also lack of love. All of these things can come into even us in the church as a body together that can drive great divisions in the church. James is warning about this. And I'm going to tell you, a fighting church won't get much accomplished. And that's, that's a fact. When a church fights and a church can't agree with each other, even when you have a group of, of churches that come together like the, like the Ministers Association, whether it be just the Southern Baptist group or whether it be multi-denominations, the community at large that does not belong to, to, to the church, they, they watch this. They see, can they get along? If they can't get along and they say they're all Christians, how are we going to do it? I mean, we don't, we don't want our church goers. We gotta be very careful not to let pride, not to let, let our desires and the lack of love and showing of it come in between and cause divisions. Verse 2, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. James continues in, 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 in a roundabout way stating, you know what, you have all these desires. Lust here is the word desire, your own personal de desires. It just doesn't mean naughtiness. It means personal <clears throat> desires, but it leads to problems. It's something that the Lord warns about. But you lust and you don't have. You desire something, but you don't, you don't have it. Whether it be corporately as a church or whether it be individually. And then he also says, he says, you kill and desire to have. And I don't think this just means we're all murdering each other. I think also, too, remember the Bible tells us in the, in the New Testament, if you hate somebody, you hate your brother. In the eyes of God, it's like killing them. It's like being a murderer. So we have to be careful, even our thoughts. You know, it's one thing to come up and smile and shake somebody's hand, and behind the mind you're thinking, ah, you, know, you, know, you know, I just wish the best for you, the best to just get out of here. That's not proper. Sometimes we, we think this way. We can't, I can't read thoughts, and people around us can't read thoughts, but guess what? God knows your thoughts. So even... Bad attitudes. We have to be very careful with this. This divides a church. And right now, I'm going to tell you, our, our world needs a stable church that's doing it right for God. We need to strive for that. Let me continue. Verse 3. You ask and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts or your pleasures. So not only do we not ask in verse 2, but... We also ask of this. It's one thing to have nice items. I'm not against having nice items and having some enjoyment. How many of you like a vacation? You can raise your hands at this. How many of you, even if you're watching, how many of you like a vacation? Aren't, aren't usually vacations good? You ever had a real vacation that stood out and it was just so good? Like everything just did it just perfect. I've had two types of vacations, I remember. When I was a little boy, we went to Disney World. We lived in Clearwater, so we were closer to, to Disney than you are here. 
And we, did, we didn't do like long vacations because my dad worked a job that he didn't get a lot of vacation time from the work. So we did a couple weekends a year. And we'd go up to Disney. And that was when Disney was $15 a person or less. Okay, so I just dated myself. Today, what is it? It's over $100. It's, it's out of my ballpark, okay? But when we went, it was less than 15. You could do some fun things. And I remember my dear grandmother, who's now in the hand with, with, with the Lord, she came with us this one time. And we got a wheelchair because she couldn't walk far. And we got there right when it opens. My dad was big on We get there when it opens. And we're in that first group that just goes in the park. And we're walking around and everything, and we saw Hall of Presidents. Now, I know some of you here are like, oh, that's my favorite one. Well, when you're a, when you're a little kid, and you have, where, where you can actually shoot 22s at targets at the shooting range, or they have all these other faster rides, and they have Pirates of the Caribbean in that, I'm gonna tell you, at least for this boy, Hall of Presidents was, no, I, I think we were at, uh, we weren't even at Jimmy Carter yet. Uh, I think we were, I think the, the one I was at was in Nixon or one of the other ones like that. I, I don't remember, but my, my grandma grew up there. And after we did Hall of Presidents, my dad splurged. He got us a snack. That's not normal. Not in the Frederick's household. Snack in Frederick's household was we'll get a cup of Kool-Aid. That was about it. We got a snack, and, and at that time they had grape juice that they sold, and that was good grape juice. I remember. And we're there, and it's about 10 o'clock, 10.30, and Grandma said the thing she should never have said. I'm tired. Let's go home. I'm tired. Let's go home. I'm done. I've seen this. And we're looking, and boy, I think all the eyes, even my mother's eyes, looked at my dad. Now this is my mother's mother, and my dad looked, looked at us, I still remember this. Okay, let's go home, Grandma. And we got to the car and we went home. That's one type of vacation. Now I've been on other vacations where we would go till we dropped in that. And I love I loved my grandmother dearly. She, she was so nice to us. But, Vacations don't always work out, but think of one that works out the very best. There's nothing wrong with that. But here Paul is here, James is saying that we ask amiss, that we focus on the wrong thing too much. When we're praying, what's the, what's so what's the important part? Now I'm not now praying for those who are ill, who need help, praying for families that need comfort because of loss of, of a loved one. That, those are important prayers. But just praying just so that we have an easy life all the time, maybe that's a prayer that's a little amiss. Maybe God's not going to respond maybe always to that kind of a prayer. Because those of us who are in the workforce who are retired from the workforce, let me ask you a question. Has every day at work been the best? Don't answer it, but just think. Has every day at work been the best? How about, how about those that are in school? Is every day at school the best day? You don't have to say anything. Not every day is going to be perfect. But God's desire is for us to continue on. And we need to, we need to put the important things first. Verse 4. Now he goes a little bit deeper. He's stepping on toes now. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the fellowship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now let me, let me explain that term adulterer. An adulteress. Now there is a there is a way that we do it in a very strict term. It's talking about not being faithful to your spouse. That's that's one of the ideas. But it also goes beyond that. Not being faithful in what you say you're going to do. Making a lot of promises and not being faithful. That's part of adultery. You know, we say, have you ever heard the statement, you're adulterating maybe this Maybe grandma's um, recipe on, on uh, cornbread. You've adulterated it. Maybe you've added ketchup to it or something like that. That's adulteration. Am I right? But here in our lives, living, we need to be very careful not to be unfaithful in what we say, to follow it with 
doing. We can say a lot of good things and say, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. And I know we all, all can, can, can do this. And things come up and there can be legitimate excuses. But when we're serving the Lord, be faithful. Be faithful in your Bible reading. Be faithful in, in, um, in your prayer life. Be faithful in trying to be the servant to those around us. Be faithful in ministering to your families. That's important because if we're not faithful, then we're adult, we're becoming adulterers to, to those areas that we should be faithful in. And how can God really, really work with us and use us? In fact, it's like we're, we're becoming almost like an enemy of God like the world is. Because I've been telling you many times in this world, there is a lot of unfaithfulness. It used to be in the workplace that, that people would respect you and, and the respect went from the top down. That's becoming very uncommon in the workplace today. And in society, so many promise, but so few follow through. As Christians, we need to follow through. We need to be faithful. Verse five, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? Now this is an odd verse. This is a very hard verse. In fact, most Bible scholars would say this is the hardest verse to translate when James wrote this in the Greek language. Let me give you a literal translation of this verse because almost every translation struggles with this. But let me give you a literal translation directly out of the Greek. Or think you that vainly the scripture says to envy yearns the spirit which was made to dwell in you. But he, God, gives great grace. So basically what he's doing is he's doing a roundabout question with this. And he's asking, do you think the scriptures really tell us to have envy? No. The scriptures tell us that we have the grace of God and that we should share grace with those around us. The Bible doesn't tell us to do wrong. The Bible tells us to do what's right. So that's what this verse is saying in a question type statement. It, it, and, and I know this is a hard verse, but I looked at this too when I was restudying this and saying, you know, that is an odd verse. And looking it up in the commentaries and looking what other scholars who have said it over the, to, over the years, this is what's come to that. It's a rhetorical question asking, do you really think the scripture's telling you to be vain? Do you, do you really think that? No. God tells us that he wants to give us grace. As a child of his, he wants to give us grace. Verse 6. But he gives more grace, and this is the response. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Folks, we need to be humble in our lives. It doesn't mean that every time we meet somebody, we grovel on our knees and that. No. What it means is, you don't have to brag on everything. You know, have you ever met a person, I, I know I, I've met a number of people like this, that as soon as you meet them, they're bragging on everything that they've done. You know every great thing that they have ever done. And probably it's embellished. It's like talking to some fisherman. I know none of you hear it this way. That the fish goes like this. You ever talk to a fisherman and where that happens, where it goes from this to this? Or maybe a deer hunter that says, oh yeah, I saw 12 I just saw 12 tw times on it. I know it wasn't really four, it was 12. I saw 12 of them. I still remember sh uh, sitting in a shooting house and I saw this, this buck come out of, the, out of the woods and I'm looking and I know there had to be so many times on each side and everything to, for it to be legal. And this thing had two on one side and one on the other. And this, this deer was just prancing around in front of the deer house. And it was getting me angry. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to start imagining more times on that on the set of horns. And that, that deer's going to stop dancing in front of me. It didn't happen. I did not poach. Your pastor did not poach, okay? I know I just said this over the airwaves, but I did not poach. It's still alive. Unless somebody else got it. But it wasn't me. But sometimes we are like this. We, we brag about things in this. We gotta be careful in that. Be humble. 
Don't be humble to the point where you're lying about it. But be yourself. Be humble. Remember God first and others second and yourself last. You do it that way, you're doing it, I believe, right according to, to Scripture. Then verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a promise. If you resist Satan, even in an area in your life where you might struggle, if you continually resist and don't give in to those temptations, do you know what happens after a while? Those temptations kind of go away. They stop being temptations. First time, it's usually very hard. It's like stopping bad habits. First time you, you don't give in, it's difficult. Second time you don't give in, it's still difficult, but a little easier. And you know, after a while, and I know some, some temptations are harder than other, others to, to get through. You can get through it, especially with God's help. And he can carry you through. Resist Satan. Because who's behind the ills in our lives? Many times we look at Satan. I know sometimes we cause our own problems because we sin. But even Satan is behind that. Satan desires for us to fail. He wants us to be done. He wants us to be over. And then the final verse, verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And this was given not just to those who are not in the church, but to those in the church. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. God does not stand in the glories of heaven with his hand out saying, back up. He stands in the glories of heaven with his arms outreached, come. He desires for us to approach him. I heard this verse preached on once very well. It was a couple years back. It was for our Santa Rosa Baptist Association yearly meeting. The Southern Baptist president used this verse in his preaching. And of everything that he said, this stands out of my mind. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. We have a world right now, if you watch the news media very much, and, I don't, and I'll tell you, you don't have to watch the news every moment of the day. It gets you angry at times because everybody says so many different things. And very people are coming, becoming very opinionated on things. And I'll tell you, a lot of the things I don't think are right what's being said. But we need to draw near to God and listen to Him. You know, I've been listening to a number of preachers preaching messages on, did God call me to be a politician or a preacher? And good statements. God did not call me to be a politician as your pastor. He called me to be your pastor. I think back to a statement that many, many years ago that Billy Graham made. Some of you may not know, but you know, he was approached by a group of politicians to run for president in his great part of his popularity. And you know what his statement was? Thank you for the offer, but God has called me to a more important job. To share my faith and to work and basically in essence to work with people about their return not to put down politics there are some people that are called to politics and there are some people that are called to lead our in our society and we need to pray for them but there are others that are called and we as individual christians we need to focus even more so on the heavenly citizenship that we hold as a christian and to share about the eternal. Not saying don't vote. I'm not saying don't give up. You know, don't don't participate. No, I've I've actually served on a uh, on on a local uh, on, on a local uh, setting where a person was running for an office. It's neat. It was fun. But my focus is on the eternality, on the whole soul. I leave you with this one thought. There was a gentleman who lived back in A.D. 333. His name was Ambrose of Milan. He was the teacher of St. Augustine. And he defended the, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. That was what he was known for. He said this. He said, God is near. And he does not drive away those who draw near to him. And he says, remember the prayers of David and of Job. And I encourage all of us. 
Fellow Christians, we need to stay in the Word of God. We need to pray. We need to assemble together, whether it be here together physically or whether it be over the live stream. We need to assemble together. And we need to be ready to be used by God in this world that needs us so. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. And Lord, as we have heard from your word, may your words have been said this morning and not just my own. But as we close our service to today with our final hymn, if there be somebody here today that does not know you as Savior, that today would be the day that they turn to you. And I would ask that that person would come to see me after our service. And I'll be happy to sit down with them and share from the Word of God how to know you as their Savior. Maybe there's someone here that doesn't have a church home and they'd like to be a member here. We'd love to have them come. Once again, if they would come, Lord, if you would encourage them through the work of the Holy Spirit to come and see me at the end of the service, that I can sit down with them and show them how to become a member here. Or maybe there's just somebody that is struggling with things in their life that I would pray with them after our service today. But whatever it is during this time, that if we have a decision to make, that we make it. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. As Doug leads us in our final hymn, let us please stand.